everyone. This is Brittany Bond, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I want to talk about something that's very sensitive uh, to me, and I think to everyone, uh, and this is about sexual trauma. Um, and I want to share how I was able to work through and process and heal and let go of my own sexual trauma <clears throat> with the goal to help other people. I hope that by sharing my story, it can help you to be able to reclaim your own power if this is something that you've gone through. And if this is something you haven't gone through, I hope this story can help you to protect yourself and make sure that this doesn't happen to you. <sighs> I, I felt called to share this because a lot of women, a lot of women reach out to me and ask like, you know, how, how were you able to trust men? And, you know, they have gone through their own sexual trauma. And, and then, you know, so this is something that it's like, people ask me about a lot. And I've shared briefly in other podcasts. Um, but then I was at the play, I was at a play party that I was organizing this last weekend. And I was connecting with a guy. And in one of the games that we did earlier in the night, we were talking about like our our views around sexuality, like how we came to, like what was our first experience around sexuality. So he was like, you know, him and I are connecting and we're vibing and he was like asking me, you know, he was sharing like his first time ha like being exposed to sexuality and like what it was for him, which was a pretty positive experience. And he was asking me like, what, what about you? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, what was the first time that you were, you know, exposed to sexuality or that you experienced it? And I was like, oh, I was sexually molested uh, by my neighbor for many years and explained a little bit about it. And he like reached for my hand and was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And, you know, wanted to comfort me. And I really appreciate that. And at the same time, I said to him, you know, I've processed my sexual trauma. I'm good. Like I'm sharing this from a place of power. And he seemed confused by that. And I, I was like. I've, and I realized, wow, this is something I want to share about because I felt like a lot of people, when they have sexual trauma, it's something that they carry with them and they don't really know who to speak to about it. They don't know how to honor the experience. They don't know how to process it. And it's just something that kind of is, yeah, something they carry throughout their lives. And it's not necessarily an empowering thing, you know? And I was like, I have chosen to make my sexual trauma something that is a place of empowerment for me you know it's like something that happened in my life and I've chosen to take it and like become more empowered in myself and that's a choice um, and I did a lot of it intuitively like no one was helping me along the way I didn't have like a therapist who was like this is how you process your trauma I was just like was just doing it and then I thought okay maybe there's something different about me than other people. Cause I just like took it and like did what I needed to, to make myself um, like grow from it and let it go. Cause I was like, I don't want, my main thing was like, this is something that happened to me when I was a little kid. And I don't, I don't want this to be something where this person is disempowering me for my whole life. I was like, fuck that. Like, this is not, I don't agree with this. And I don't like, I choose to, like I, that person already took so much from me in that moment and in that time period. And I don't, I'm choosing to not allow that person to take from me my power and my feeling of safety and trust in the world and in men for the rest of my life. Like I was like, no, 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 this is, this, this is not how this is going to go. Um, okay. So here's the story. Um, it's very, whew, it's going to take a deep breath. <sighs> and I'm sitting in the park and there's just like randomly this older couple that just sat down next to me, like facing me. Like, <laughs> I was like, okay, that's happening. Um, so if you followed my podcast, you know that like I was raised in um, a religious cult. So I was very like sheltered when it comes to sex. Like I didn't know, I didn't know how sex worked until like I was maybe 12 and it was in my sex ed class in junior high and it was 
it was just like, oh, that's what sex is, you know? Like, no one sat me down when I was little and was like, you know, this is what it is and this is how to protect yourself and, like, don't let men touch you here or, like, you know, like, don't let anyone touch you here or there. Um, so I didn't have any of that. Um, and when I was uh, six years old, my dad had something happen where he got a flesh eating like disease in his arm. Um, we went to the water park and he had a scratch on his arm from one of the water slides and the water was very dirty and ended up contaminated, like the bacteria contaminated it. And so he had like this, like this flesh eating disease take over this whole one side of his body and he almost had to have his arm amputated. Ended up healing but his immune system was so low from that that he got cancer the next year. And so my dad ended up like, so my dad's like, you know, almost 200 centimeters tall, like 6'6", six, six, and like this big bear of a man and very protective and very controlling and ended up being very abusive to me later in my life. But at that moment when I was a child, he was like my protector. And suddenly he was in the hospital and my mom hadn't really worked. Like my dad always wanted to make sure that my mom could just be home with us and um, spend her time taking like you know enjoying growing up like ha raising us and he always wanted to provide and take care of us so I appreciate him for that suddenly that that like source of protection was gone he was in the hospital for almost a whole year and <clears throat> my mom ended up needing to get a job because we, it, I grew up in California and we didn't have my dad was a construction worker and we didn't have insurance and so we were barely like able to pay for his medical coverage. I remember one of my first ever memories around money was my parents fighting of, over whether they could afford to have my dad get treatment for cancer, which is just a terrible, it's already like, that's a terrible thing for a child to go through. And so, you know, I just could feel this pressure of my family, like really <clears throat> being worried about money. And um, my mom ended up meeting this man who owned an exotic car dealership. Um, he was British. His name was Laurie. He was in his, like, 60s. And he was very charismatic and very wealthy. And he offered my mom. My, my mom was very, very beautiful. Like, even to this day, like, people are like, oh, is she your sister? You know, that kind of, like, she just has this thing about her. And I always told myself when I was little, like, I want to grow up and be as beautiful as my mom. Um, so anyways, this man, Lori, offered my mom a job. He, and so she started working for him. And then he was like, um, we lived in a two bedroom apartment when there was five of us. I have two sisters. So like my sis, my two sisters and I shared a room and then my parents and this guy, Lori offered to, he's like, I have like, there's a house. I, I own this very big house and there's like this, he was the head of, in the States we call it the homeowners association. So it's like your community. He was like the president of like his, the small community. And he's like, there's a house within our community that is up for rent. Do you guys want to live there? And he made it so that we could get it for very affordable. And, and then, so all suddenly we weren't from the situation where like, my dad was in the hospital, you know, we weren't sure if he was going to survive. And suddenly this guy was like helping my mom and offering her a job. And then like, like giving us like a really nice place to live. And so we moved into this like big house and it was the first time that I had, I lived in a house and I was like seven and then we had a yard and, and it was like really beautiful and it was in nature and the community had its own private lake and, it was just like suddenly, you know, we had this really beautiful home and he, <clears throat> he was the only one in the neighborhood that had a pool. And so he always invited like all the kids over to play. He had grandkids. And so we were over there all the time playing. And he asked me like, Brittany, do you want to come over sometimes and um, like cut our lawn, like mow our lawn? He had an automatic a lawnmower and he's like I can give you some money and you can come over and mow the lawn and for me in my little child brain I was like oh my family really needs money I would love to do this um 
And so I would go over there and cut his lawn and he would give me $50. So this is like a lot of money for a little child. Like I was like, wow, like I'm making the money. And I'm, and I would go and like give it to my mom. And I was so proud that I was like helping my family. And Lori had a wife who was also in her 60s. And, you know, so I would go over there and hang out with them. They would like give me tea and like, you know, they were British and they were just like always drinking tea. And... I was just like, this is so nice. Like, wow, life is like, life is better. Like, this is amazing. And then, and then Lori started inviting me into his, I don't really like in my brain, like in my memory, I think I've blocked out a lot of this, but, um, I just remember that suddenly there was a moment where I was in his office and he would sit me on his lap and watch porn and touch himself and touch me and like sexually and I just remember like freezing and not really knowing what was going on and then and then he would drive me home and then sometimes he would like be like oh you can sit on my lap and I can teach you to drive but then he would always be like molesting me when he was driving me and but he would also give me money and so there was this part of my brain that was like like, you know, when you don't know what sex is, you're like, okay, this is, I don't, I didn't even really understand what was going on. And also I really wanted to give my mom the money because we really needed money to pay for my dad's medical bills. Um, so I didn't tell my parents. And then I also remember like being little and just being like, my mom is under so much stress and I don't like, I, f I was like, something's off about this and something feels wrong. Like, I don't like this. Um, but I don't want to put more stress on my mom. And so I didn't tell her. And this went on for, you know, I don't know how long, like like maybe a year, maybe two years. So like every couple months I would go over there and mow the lawn and then he would sit me on his lap and molest me and watch porn. So like this went on for a while. And then one day I just remember being like, I can't do this anymore. And I just went home and I told my mom, I don't want to go over there anymore, mom. Like I don't. And she was like, okay, you know, whatever you want to do, honey. Um, and I remember we would go over and like, we would still go over and like play in the pool. And I, I just felt so grossed out by the whole situation. And still in my little child brain, I thought that's somehow like, you know, he was the adult and he should have known better and, or somehow like it was my fault. Like I was like, cause when you're a little kid, you believe that the parents and the adults in the situation know more than you. And so you just kind of trust them. You trust them to protect you and to take care of you and to do what's good for you. And, and I just remember thinking like, I don't want to hang out over here anymore. And then, and then I finally told my mom, like, I don't want to go over there and go to the pool anymore. And she was like, Oh, okay. Are you sure? Like, is everything okay? And cause I know how much you love, I love swimming. I'm like a little mermaid in the water. And I just said, ah, yeah, I just don't want to go anymore. And, and then my dad, my dad ended up getting better and coming out of the hospital and then, like, from then on, like, I would only go over to Lori's house, like, if my dad was there. And I felt really protected by my dad. Um, and he would, of course, like, not do anything when my dad was around. Um, so, there's also parts of the situation that I feel like I've blocked out. Like, I don't know if he raped me. Because I feel like maybe that's too much for me to... Um, like for my brain to handle like my like this is a real thing like I've researched this since then of just um like suppressing things and it was the first time that I um if you know what astral projection is it's like I literally went out of my body and I remember like looking down on the situation from out of my body because it was too much for my body to handle so that's what happened and it really fucked with tr my trust in men, my sexuality, and also my association with men and money. Like, cause if you think about it, like I allowed this to happen, but I also got money from it. Um, so there was like this association with like men, sexuality equals money, which is all super fucked up. So 
I never, I never like forgot that it happened. Like there's people who say like, you know, you know, 10 years later, then they like suddenly have this suppressed memory that, that came up. It's like, and then they're like questioning whether this happened or not. Like for me, I was, I didn't, I didn't compartmentalize it that much. Like I understood that this happened, but it was something where I was just like, I never spoke up about it with my family. I didn't. And then my dad ended up getting really abusive and like my family just situation just kept getting worse and worse. And I was like, who do I even speak to about this? You know, like I didn't have the support to, to talk to. I didn't have anyone that I felt that safe enough to bring this up with. So I just kept it to myself and you know, as the situation with my dad got worse, he was never sexually abusive, but he got very physically abusive and emotionally abusive to me, um, me especially, because I was the only one who really spoke up um, about it. Like my sisters would kind of just go along with it. My mom would just become very submissive and and just like not do anything. Um, and I just remember thinking like, I really want to go into law. Like I wanted to study law and I wanted to be able to like protect myself and like women. And I now looking back on this, I realized that this was like me really wanting to like protect myself and also, yeah, figure out a way to get more power over the situation and over my life so that I could make sure it never happens again and also make sure it doesn't happen to other women. And... I ended up, yeah, I ended up studying law and working in a law firm for six years. This was my first <laughs> timeline of my, my career life. Um, and in the middle of this, like I had just gotten my, f- I was 18. I had just gotten my first law firm job because um, I went to this program where they like do a job placement. They place you into a law firm as an intern, even while you are going to university still. Um, so I started working very young in, in it and I looked up in the States we have something called the statutory of limitations. It means like the timeline of when you can still bring something up to charge to like press charges. And in California, the statutory limitations, like the time limit of when you can bring up and press charges for sexual molestation is up until you're 21. So I was 18 or 19 at the time and I realized that, okay, I can still press charges against him and I'm going to do this. Like, I'm going to speak up about this. So I went into my local police station. I had moved, I had moved away from my hometown at this point and was married. Um, and I just told my husband, I'm like, I'm going to speak up about this. And he was like, okay, I support you. Let me know whatever I can do to help. And I was like, no, this is something I need to do by myself. Like, this is for, this is for me. This is for my inner child. And so I just remember (laughs) sometimes I look back and I'm like, did I really do that? But like on my way to work one day, I just went to the police station and I told them this happened. I want to press charges. And they were like, okay, um, we'll come back tomorrow and we will, in order for us to open a case, we need to, the best, the best way to press charges against him is to um, have you confront him and try and get it recorded because if we can get a recorded confession then that is like a hundred percent the best way that we can create like open a case and press charges and I was like okay so I went back the next morning and again I just went to work acted like everything was fine um so the next morning I went to I went back to the PlayStation and this is like in like 2009 you know so I had my like first cell phone and they like put this recorder attached to my cell phone and they were like two men were in the room with me and two policemen and I called him I called the house uh, where Lori lived and his wife picked up and I was like hi this is Brittany you know this has been it had been like 10 years since since I had this situation happened and maybe eight years since I had spoken to them and I was like, hi, this is pretty, I need to speak to Lori. And I could already feel the panic in her voice of like, oh, he's not here. What do you want? And I was like, wow, she knew, you know? And I was just, because there was always this part of me that was like, does she know what's going on? And sh- she knew because she was, she was acting like, yeah, she was acting as if she knew. And she was just like, he's not here. 
what can I do? Like, are you okay? And I was like, no, I need to speak to him. And I knew she was going to try and call him. So I looked, we looked up his, he owned an exotic car dealership. So we looked up his work phone and I called that immediately and he answered the phone. And I said to him, you know, it was not okay what you did to me. And like, I, I want you to apologize. And he, he wouldn't admit he like the police wanted him to say what he had done. They wanted him to say it in his own words. And he was the, the most he would say is, I'm sorry for what I did. It wasn't right. And I was like, and I just kept saying like, well, why did you molest me? Like, why did you put me on your lap and watch porn? And like, why did you do all these things? And he was just like, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what I did. Like, I shouldn't have done that. But he like wouldn't say it in his own words. And I was just like, this is not okay. Like, you shouldn't do this. And like, I have, I was like, and did you, and I was like, did you do this to other women? It's other little girls. And he, he like wouldn't answer. And I, and I realized I was like, wow, maybe I wasn't the only one. Um, so anyways, ended the phone call. I went to work. I totally just acted like everything was fine. And I don't think that that is actually a good thing. I think I should have created a lot of space for me to process, but at the time, again, I didn't have the tools. There wasn't anyone who was like, hey, you know, this is trauma and this is like how you process trauma and you should create a lot of space for you to feel your emotions and like allow your body to have its response. I just like went to work, acted like everything was fine and then like went home and like cried myself to sleep. Um, and they ended up opening a case and the police said that there was other women, other little girls that he had done this to, and they were gathering evidence and they were asking me if I wanted to, um, I had, I had moved to a different state at this point and they were like, if it goes to court, like, do you want, like he either needs to admit it and then he'll get processed. And if he doesn't, then it needs to go to trial. And then like, would you come and, and like, would you come and like testify? And I said, no, I have done what I need to do for my little child, my inner child. I've spoken up for myself. And at that point, it didn't really matter to me if he went to jail or not, because for me, it was more about like the re- him having the realization that what he did was wrong and to own that. And it was already enough that he was getting, um, a case opened against him like it was uh, in my mind he was never going to do it again because like someone had stood up and now it was on record and he was being investigated and so I was like at least I'm going to protect all the other women that are around him now because he's going to know that like you know people are watching him and for me I wanted to live my life like I didn't want to spend my life trying to punish him I wanted to live my life by speaking up, telling him it was not okay. And then in my mind, he could just fuck off. You know, I was like, I don't want to think about you anymore. Um, And it felt so powerful. I felt like I had like reclaimed my power by speaking up and also like directly telling him like, hey, this was not okay. I was a little kid, you know, and like, you know, I didn't know what was going on and you like took advantage of me. Um, So then you know, that happened. And I had this moment where I was like, okay, I could just close up here and just not trust men ever again. Or I can choose to enjoy my life. And I was like, I choose pleasure, you know, and I was like, I I don't want my, I don't want to be shut down. I want to like be lit up. Like for me, pleasure is Anything that lights m- my spirit up, lights my body up, makes me feel like my inner child can come out to play. And it can be dancing, and it can be sex, it can be reading a book, it can be a- every connecting to friends, but it's like, I want to live my life from that, from that vibration. And also intuitively, I, you know, I married someone who wasn't my he was, I wasn't in love with him. And I think this was because I didn't trust men. And I felt like if I allowed myself to be in love with someone, yeah, I would have to trust them. (laughs) So, um, you know, there's this like feeling of like, I could be hurt. And I already had been so hurt by my dad and this guy who had molested me that I was just like, 
I didn't have the capacity to open myself up to more situations that could hurt me. But at the same time, intuitively, I was like, I want to enjoy sex. I want to enjoy like living my life. And so I, I got with, I married someone who was a very good man. He always took care of me and he was like my best friend. And it was very much like, you know, we, we both were virgins when we got married and also we both were raised in this religious cult. And so none, neither of us really understood what sex was. And we just played like little kids. Like I remember we were married for six years and I just remember us like rolling around in bed for so many days. And like we had sex all the time and it was just like us just figuring it out and just like, yeah, like letting our inner kids come out to play. And through that like safety bubble, I healed a lot. Like I healed, I was able to figure out like what brought me pleasure. I was able to speak up for what I wanted and also to like claim my boundaries because, you know, I I hadn't ever been able to do that. And so this was like a safe space for me to play in. And even though I wasn't in love with him, I was just like, at least I felt safe to play and to like kind of grow back this trust I had with my own body and and that was really beautiful and and then when I when I did that I realized and all of this again like all of this is subconscious it wasn't like I was like I'm gonna marry him because I'm not in love with him and but he's a good safe person it was just all like it all just kind of flowed in this direction and I don't regret any of it and I learned so much And at the same time, because I wasn't in love with him, I wasn't able to go deeper in my pleasure because I was like, not actually that attracted to you, you know, like sexually. In the sense that like for me, sex is like sacred and it's joyful and it's like connecting two souls who are like deeply in love with each other and like being able to create this like connection to source energy you know and you only can go so far if you have sex with someone that you're not in love with or not super attracted to so I realized that I wanted to be met by my partner and so I but I realized I wasn't in love with him like a year in you know like I when I finally felt safe to like really see it and like look at it I was like, wow, I'm not in love with him. And then I felt really bad because I was like, oh, but I've married him. I've committed. And then my religion, like you're married, not only for this timeline, you're married in the afterlife. So I was like, I just signed myself up for, you know, many eternity of, you know, lovelessness and friendship and beautiful, safe, safe, safety and comfort, but not love, not like ecstatic, you know, deep soul penetrating love and I really feel like this is what I deserve um so but I stayed I I stayed in the relationship for five more years thinking like well maybe I can fall in love with him and maybe it grows like people people in my church kept saying like oh no it it grows like you can love you can learn to love someone and and I and I really put the effort in and it just wasn't working and then I finally got a therapist who was just like you know your needs are just as important and valid as everyone else's and you're allowed to speak up for them in this way even if even if your religion is telling you not to even if society is telling you not to and so finally I got the courage to sit down my ex-husband and say to him I don't want to be married anymore like I love you as a person but like I don't want to do this like I'm living a lie and I need to be authentic to myself And that was really hard and he did not take it well and he ended up trying to kill himself twice and then I realized like wow the relationship had become very codependent and like or he had I think he has mental health issues there was just a lot of things that was going on and I was just like I need to do what is okay with me and I can't stay with someone and stay married to someone just because if I leave they might kill themselves like I can't stay with someone just because they might threaten to kill themselves if I like that already. I was like, Oh no, no, this is a fuck. No, like this is like not okay. It's randomly a helicopter. Just going to let that play out for a second. Um, 
So I realized that I wanted to be met by a partner. Like I wanted to be in love. I actually thought this, there was something broken in me because of my sexual trauma. I was like, maybe I won't allow myself to be open enough to be loved and to really fall in love with someone where I'm like, I am so excited by their existence. I love them so much. And like my inner kids just get so excited when I see them and we get to like, yeah, play in all ways. And I'm attracted to them sexually and I want to like have sex with them, you know? Um, so I went on this journey of like many years of um, dating men and the first man that I fell in love with, I was so excited. I was like, wow, I'm not broken. <laughs> um, and this guy, his name's Oz. He's a lovely man who's married and has kids now. I'm so happy for him. Um, he, him and I have the exact same birthday, month, day, and year. Like to the, and, but he was born in Turkey and I was born in California. And I just think there's some like universal cosmic stuff happening there because I felt like I met myself reflected in a man. And we have like the same like sexual desires, the same like energy, everything. And it just felt so beautiful to be met. Um, but you know, there's many other reasons why we broke up and we don't, he wants to live in London and like base there. Like there's like many reasons why we ended up breaking up and it was very sad at the time, but I was like so happy that I wasn't broken and so happy that I could keep growing and exploring my desires. And then I realized like throughout dating a lot of men that I was still very programmed to please men sexually and, and like, yeah, like make sure their needs are met first. And I started meeting men who, who were, who were like, no, it, they were like, it is my job to make you orgasm before we ever have penetrative sex. I remember the first time I sat with someone like this and I was like, what? Like, this is, this is how it can be. Like men can really just like honor you and cherish you and honor your needs and, and really just like love you and take care of you and want to like pleasure you and your body before you have sex before they, you know, they are getting pleasure. And so I just kind of like, I healed a lot of my trauma through allowing myself in ways that I felt safe to open up to other relationships and other dynamics and other men. Um, so fast forward to a couple of years ago and I, I felt I had been feeling very called to do ayahuasca. Like if you're talking about like healing sexual trauma, my, the, I took mushrooms. The first time I ever took any psychedelics, I was 28 years old. So this is, I'm 33. So this is five years ago. And I took a lot of mushrooms and it really helped me like from a somatic experiencing. So that means like what my body is experiencing from that level, it helped me to release a lot of the trauma that had happened from my sexual trauma. Because I didn't realize that like intellectually, I was okay with like dating men and putting myself in these situations. But my body was still so scared and rightfully so, you know, and I was like, okay, I want to be gentle with my body and, and really honor it and all this stuff. But there was some stuff that was very subconscious of my body trying to protect itself to make sure the trauma didn't happen again. And it was preventing me from opening up to really beautiful love, really beautiful men that really all they wanted to do was take care of me and love me. And I loved them, but my body was like, you know, um, self-sabotaging situations. And so I wasn't forcing anything to happen, but I was like open to exploring it. And the, I started taking mushrooms like on my own. I took them with a partner who really helped me and guided me through. And I'm so ha grateful for that. Um, and so mushrooms really helped me like from a somatic experiencing level, but they only went so deep, you know, like you only can go so far on a mushroom trip of really looking at your stuff and healing stuff. And so I, I, I had been hearing about ayahuasca a lot and I was like, I feel really called to do ayahuasca. But again, I wanted to make sure it was a safe space. And I was like, maybe I'll go to Peru, like, you know, go, go into South America and really 
you know, f- find the right shaman and like really go through the experience. But then COVID happened and I got locked down in Copenhagen and I was like, I really feel called to do ayahuasca right now. And so I did ayahuasca. I found a, a facilitator who was um, good enough. Because <laughs> um, for me, I realized too, it's like because you have sexual trauma, you are extra sensitive for safe spaces. And I, I read somewhere that your biggest heartaches are the biggest gifts that you can give the world. And because I have been in so many unsafe spaces growing up in many different ways, I know what it feels like on a somatic, like on a body experiencing level, what feels safe in my body. And I am probably one of the most sensitive people for that. And because I'm one of the most sensitive people and I make sure that I feel safe in the room, I really am able to create safety for everyone else because I'm like, you know, like if this doesn't feel safe for me, it probably doesn't feel safe for other people. So I really like from a hosting facilitating point of view. So I'm very picky when it comes to facilitators holding space for me, especially on psychedelics. And I think everyone should be, but for me, especially I'm like, "Mm." so anyways, I found someone who was good enough and I took ayahuasca and ayahuasca. If you know, if you don't know anything about it, you, it's like, this it's like herbs like from the amazon rainforest and they you take it it to me it tastes like dirt that you're drinking and they do like a guided sound journey and the and the shamans are like protecting the the space and protecting the energy of the space and you go into the spirit world and everyone sees a feminine like elderly woman spirit when they take ayahuasca. So for me, when I took it, I, yeah, I connected to the spirit and she was like, I said to her, I was like, I want to heal my trauma. I want to be like fully in my power. And she was like, okay, are you sure that you are ready to, to do this? And I was like, yes, I'm so ready. Like, hello, let's go. And she was like, okay, then I'm going to hold your hand and we are going to go into that room where he molested you and we are going to really look at it and I was like oh no no I don't know I don't think I'm ready and she was like okay we don't have to it's up to you use your choice and I was like laying there for a while because you take ayahuasca at night and then they're playing this really beautiful music and I was just like kind of it was in the spirit world and I was just like Mm, okay okay yes I want to look at it I want to look at it and she was like okay I'm going to take you your inner child by the hand and we're going to go into this room with this man and you're going to look at it and face it and I and I did and I I really it's like I went back to the original trauma and I felt how it felt for me as a little kid like all of the times I had gone out of my body which was still happening to my body but I in my, you know, my physical mind construct wasn't able to handle that as a kid. And so I just left and I went back in and I went and I held space for my inner child as she went through that experience. And I really honored it. And I like, I, as my inner loving parent was there for her while she went. So she wasn't alone anymore. And it was really hard. And, um, and then (laughs) Mama Ayahuasca was like, okay, I'm really proud of you. Like, you are more brave than most people. And I'm going to show you how this moment of this happening to you has affected every single other moment in your life. And I saw like these flashes of times where I wasn't able to connect to someone that I loved and I wasn't able to trust and I wasn't able to allow my inner child out to play because I wanted her to be safe. And also how it affected like the way I looked at money and how it affected I, the way I interacted with men and money and just how it kind of like fucked everything up all all along the way. Um, And it was a lot. And it was like, 
I'm really proud of myself for going through that. Um, and also I was able to release a lot because I had the understanding and I learned how it affected me all the way through my life. I had the power now to change my timeline. I had, because I had the conscious awareness of what was happening, I had the power to consciously change it now for the better and do something different. And that I woke up the next morning, like, you know, they you sleep there. You, you, ayahuasca goes through the night and then at some point you fall asleep and I woke up the next morning and I felt so light. I felt like, I felt like my inner child, you know? And she was like, I just want to play. And it was really beautiful. Like, I just like, the, I didn't realize that I was carrying so much heaviness around me. Like, this big, like, protective cloak. And, you know, from the outside, most people think that I'm, like, very empowered and very in my pleasure and all these things. But I didn't realize how much on the inside I was constricted and not open to allowing myself to enjoy my life. And that was suddenly not necessary anymore because suddenly I felt safe. I felt safe for the first time as an adult in my body. And I felt safe enough to allow myself to play in all ways, like, like literally play like my, so what happened after that was they say when you go and you really, um, look at your trauma, there's this time period afterwards where you go back to the emotional reality of who you were when the trauma happened. It's like when trauma happens, some part of you gets like stuck and because you protect yourself but then you're not allowing that part to grow. So it was like um, suddenly this like little 10 year old version of me, seven to 10 year old version of me needed to be honored. And so for the next two weeks, I just laid in bed and I watched cartoons and I cried a lot and I like drew and I painted and I listened to music and my body was just so tired. It was like, I didn't realize I'd been carrying this like tiredness around because I've been trying to protect myself to feel safe for so many years and it was like suddenly I could rest like I had been going through this like battle that I didn't realize I was going through like I was at war <laughs> to protect myself and then suddenly the war was over and I could just rest and it was so beautiful and yeah it was it was like, it was everything. And, and then at the same time, I was like, I've always felt so protective over women. And I was like, I don't want this to happen to like any other women. And yeah, there's, I've always had this strong desire to empower the women in my life and empower all women in the world. And like even more so now, now that I was like able to feel safe, I had so much more energy for it. You know, like I wasn't using all this energy to protect myself from something that didn't need to be protected anymore. So during this timeline, um, I realized that a lot of the men that I was attracted to, I also was attracted to them because they made me feel safe. They made me feel protected and because I didn't need that protection anymore from the external because I was protecting myself internally. Like the person I was in a relationship with at that moment, I realized that I was in a relationship with, I loved him, but I was in a relationship with him a lot of the reason why is because I felt safe around him. And I was like, oh, this is like, oh, this is, I was like, I did it again. Like I'm in a relationship with someone because I felt safe and I trust them, but not necessarily because I'm super in love with them. And eventually that relationship ended and I took some Tantra immersions that were really amazing on the island and I felt very safe in and I really allowed myself to drop into my body, connect to the pleasure. And then I was like, I want a safe place to play and 
and like allow my inner child to play sexually. Like I was like, I want to reprogram what it feels like in my body to play sexually, but in a safe way. So me and two friends, we got together and we started doing these things we called sexy Zen because one of the friends, she wanted to, um, dress up and make cake and like have us all wear sexy kimonos and then the other friend he was like super into meditation and like tea ceremonies and so I was like let's make it called sexy zen because I was like I wanted to have like a sexy party so we did them at my community space with our close friends and they were such a hit like we just had so much fun just like being sexy with each other there was no penetrative sex allowed and so it was just us playing as like little kids you know before you know what sex is where you're like programmed by the outside world in those like built um those kept growing and more and more people found out about them and then those two friends that I started that with they moved away and I decided this is something I'm feeling really called to and I and I started doing play parties but the the reason why I I started them initially was because I wanted to connect to my own desire and I wanted to feel safe to play like my inner little kid was like I didn't get to do this when I was a kid like you know I got molested and then I got married at 18 as a virgin and I was just like in these like serial monogamous relationships for most of my life and so I never had this timeline where I was just like free and playful and allowing myself to speak up for my desires And so this is what the play parties were. They were mostly because I wanted to create a safe space for me to play. And then I realized, wow, this is something that a lot of people need. And it was really beautiful. And this is why I keep going. Like, I really feel like I'm in service when I do them. Um, And I do it from a place of not needing anything. I I have the abundance. Like, I'm of myself. I'm good in myself. I have my partner. I love love the man that I'm with. And I'm doing this because it's fun to play. And I love creating safe spaces for other people to play. And then this last year, I, I really felt like, okay, I have, as an independent woman, I have come into my full, like, empowerment, like, sexually and in my life. And I was like, from this place of power, I feel finally ready to be met by my partner, by a, someone who is my equal. I kept saying to my friends, I want someone who's like me, like in all ways. Like I want my partner in crime, you know, we say in English. And I want someone who, who's, my baseline emotion is joy. Like if you know me really well, you know that I am just always looking for the bright side. I'm always like, it can always get better. And I just, I, I am so joyful and I want to bring this joy to the world. And I was like, I want to, I choose to have the man who is the love of my life have his baseline emotion also be joy and to be doing beautiful things in the world just like I'm doing beautiful things and to be met and also for him to be powerful like I was ready to be met in my power and I was ready to trust and be open to someone who was powerful and then entered my life beautiful fair day and we've had an amazing love story um, of us getting together we knew each other for six months before we told each other we liked each other, but it grew, you know, over that timeline and we were in each other's hearts and building that trust with each other. And I love that with him, it's, it's like, I can speak all of this too. you know, like he's going to listen to this. He's the first person who's going to listen to this podcast. And he's like always so supportive of me and always so supportive of me in all ways and especially in my sexual desires and my growth and you know we just had a play party last weekend and it was the first time that I felt safe to play with other men you know after Faraday and I started dating and there was this question and I had where I was like is he going to be okay with this and is he going to be okay and supportive of me feeling pleasure with other men and he was and it was beautiful and I was like wow I really am embodying this thing that I love to say about being chosen and free because within myself I have spent so much of my life getting free from the programming and the trauma and like yeah the molestation that happened to me 
but I also really want to be chosen by someone that I love and I want to choose them and I want to love them and have them be free too and let them also follow their desires. So I'm here to tell you that you can have it all. <laughs> um, and also, you know, if you, if you really, if you have gone through sexual trauma, like the most important thing is to create a safe space for yourself to be able to look at it and to ask yourself like what can I learn from this like what because when you're able to learn something from the situation and this is why I always say like your biggest heartaches are the biggest gifts that you can give the world if you can grow from it if you can reclaim your power in some way then it's then it, it will definitely help and by doing that you can release it and let it go and what I found is like when you go through trauma, it's really important to be honored in the experience, like to share it with someone that you trust, whether it's a therapist or a coach or mama ayahuasca and have them honor you in this experience. Like, yes, I, I see you. You went through this. It was really hard. I love you. You're amazing. You know, like it's OK. And then to sit with it and ask yourself, like, what can I take away from this? How can I grow as a person? And like, how can I make the world a better place because I went through this experience so that it doesn't mean like make it mean something positive and, and then let it go. Don't let that person or the situation that happens to you be this burden that you carry for the rest of your life. That's a choice that you have. You don't have to. And I, I found that speaking up about it, like literally speaking it out loud or, and it could be like writing it in your journal first or speaking it to yourself on a voice memo, but putting it outside of your body is so healing because it's no longer just something that's sitting in you because everything is energy. And when you can release that energy in some way, it helps it so you get perspective on it. And also it just like starts the process going of having you to be able to heal it and release it. And something that I've always felt is that like my soul chose this timeline. And this is something you can agree with or not. Because some people are like, why would your soul choose a timeline where you're being sexually molested? And it's like, well, my soul felt like it's something that I could go through, you know. And of course, like no one should have to go through this. And I'm choosing a timeline in the future where no one goes through this. And no one has to learn and grow through this. But for whatever reason, this is what my soul chose. And I'm here to make it mean something by sharing this with you and telling you that you can use this as a, as a point of empowerment in your life by choosing to work through it, process it, and release it. And for me, like because I went through all that trauma, I am so protective of women and I'm so sensitive to safe spaces and power dynamics and like making sure that, you know, even if you're powerful, you're using it to serve, you know, you're not using it to take other people's power away, which is what this man did to me. And I, I feel really empowered to help others drop into their body and connect to their desires and play like the little kids that we all are. Because I didn't have that, I want to make sure that everyone else has the opportunity for that. And that's something that you can do too. You can look at it and be like, okay, what didn't I have? And like, can I create situations for other people to have what I didn't have? Because you know very personally what it felt like to not have that. And also for me to like have the support, like this is also why I do coaching with women. Like if you are a woman especially and you want to work through your sexual trauma and you want to have a coach, like this is something I feel very called to do and I help a lot of women with this because it's so important to be honored in our experience and I didn't have this. I didn't have someone who was like, yes, I know what that's like. I've been there. And yeah, you're doing great. And like, here's some, here's some tools. And here's some resources to help you work through it. So, yeah, there's just like so much I could say. Um, but the last thing I want to bring up is um, in order to prevent trauma, I think this is an important part to, to share, is like, it's one thing that I want to say is like, especially to the women who are listening to this, like everyone, but especially to the women, we have so much programming from the moment we are born 
from society, from our parents, religion, doesn't matter, to please, to please others first before we please ourselves. And because of this programming, there's a lot of situations that we get ourselves into where later we look back and we're like, that was not okay. My, because your, your body in the moment is recognizing it's not okay, but you're just, you're in this pleasing mode and you go along with it. And then you realize later, oh fuck, like I just got traumatized, you know, like this is something that's like hurting me and this was not a good thing that happened. And in order to prevent trauma, it's really important to take responsibility for our boundaries and our pleasure. So like honor what I call your sacred no. Like if at any moment it is not a fuck yes in your body, it's a no. So if you're in a situation with someone and they want to do something sexually with you, if you're not completely turned on and like it's a fuck yes, then it's a no. And you could always do it later if, if it is turns into a yes. And if at any moment it was a yes and then suddenly it's not a yes anymore, then speak up. Say, no, I don't want to do this. And if the person doesn't honor you and if you're worried, a lot of times we please because we're worried about losing affection, losing connection, losing love. If that person, if you lose any of those things with that person because you honored your body, that person doesn't deserve to be in your life. So honor your sacred no. And the people that deserve to be in your life will also honor your body. They will honor you respecting your boundaries and your desires. And if it is a fuck yes, then speak up for that too. Like don't wait for the guy. We have so much programming that the like men need to know exactly what our desires are and like read us, read our minds and our bodies and just like do things. It's like, speak up for your desires. There's so many times like this morning before we came to the park, Faraday and I were in the kitchen and I was like, do you want to make love? Like, I want to make love. And he's like, yes, I would love to, you know? And it's like a lot of times I initiate because I'm feeling into my body. And a lot of times he waits for me to initiate because he wants to make sure it's a fuck yes in my body. And for a lot of times men, for most men, it's like a fuck yes, a lot more than it is for women. For us, we need context of like, do I feel good? Like, do I have enough space, you know, for aftercare? Like, do, am I am I in a mind frame where I can really drop into my body or should I do it later? Should we do this later when I can? So, yeah, I just want to say that like, the more that we like knowledge is power. And the more that we can empower ourselves to understand our bodies and understand what pleasure is in our bodies, then we can empower ourselves to speak up for when it is a yes and to speak up for when it's a no and to honor all of that. Okay, so I hope this helped you. Um, and I also, the last thing I want to say is that like, I share all of this from a place of power. Like, I I don't need anyone to tell me, oh Brittany, I'm so, like I'm so sorry that happened to you. Like, like the reason why I say that is because I do that for myself, and I have, you know, and if I really am in a moment where like my inner child needs to be held and I need some extra support, then I I have the people that I need to to reach out, and so I empower you to also build this community, like build this connection with yourself first. And then also build your close support network of the people who have earned the right to hear your story and to hold you in that. Because for me, it's a very precious thing for me to allow someone to show up for me when I'm in those moments, when I'm really like meeting my inner child and like holding myself in my pain and my trauma and processing it. Because I want to make sure that they actually know me and love me and they actually have the tools to host me. Because a lot of times people want to show up for you, but they don't know what to do and they can actually make it worse. So like make sure you build your support network of people who have the resources, have the tools, or tell them, you know, I want to share something, but this is how I want to be held and supported in this. Can you do this? Like with Faraday, a lot of times I tell him like, I just want to share this and I just want to hug. You know, I don't need it to be fixed. Like I, I, I already know what I need to do or I'm going to figure it out. Or there's times where I'm like, I've been crying for a while. I need a hug and I need a little pep talk. And he's like, okay, I'm on it. Let's go. And he's like, loves, loves helping and being there for me in whatever way. And I'm always there for him too. You know, it like goes both ways. It's not like only men are showing up for women. Like 
I'm there for him, giving him pep talks all the time or listening to him and helping him work things out. It's like, this is what partnership is. And this is what's so beautiful about being in love with someone who is your match, you know, and who really loves you and can show up for you. And I wish this for everyone. (sighs) I invite you to take lots of deep breaths. That was a lot. (sighs) And I hope you have a beautiful day. This is Brittany Bond signing off. And I will see you in the next episode.